step two. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And the scripture tied in with that is, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. I want us to go to the book of Hebrews. Go with me to chapter 12. Um, oh, chapter 12. And we're going to talk about healing faith tonight. Hope and faith. And step two. I'm going to go in Hebrew. Just hold your finger. I just want to share something here with you. Now, first we have to admit that we're insane. Now, we are, you know, another, a lot of people define insanity a lot of different ways, okay? People say people are insane by, you know, losing their mind and having no marbles. But insanity is repeating the same mistakes and expecting a different result. That's insane. If you think that you can do something and do something over and over again and think that something different is going to come out of it, it's insane thinking because the same thing's going to happen or it's going to get even worse. It, it never gets better. So we know that the definition of insanity. So we know that God has to restore us to sanity because our sin nature is insane. It's selfish, self-serving, right? Full of what? Scorekeeping and resentments and bitterness. I mean, if you look at our... If you look at your family tree with people, I mean, my biological family, I remember all the things that my mother used to hold against people because, you know, they didn't show up at a wake or, or something like that. They wouldn't talk to them ever again. They'd write them off and they'd never forgive them. I mean, you don't have to be at a wake to pray for somebody or to, to care about somebody. You know, it's just, you know, most of the time you go to a wake and it's like a reunion for people. Yeah. Yeah. And they're over there like laughing and joking and everything else. When the person that didn't want to go there, they didn't want to remember that person, see them for the last time in a casket. So they go in the bedroom and pray for them. But because they didn't show up, they're no good. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to understand that, you know, uh, people, are, the, the sin nature is insane. And then what we really do is hold things against people. And we, and we, and we, the devil makes us remember everything that's wrong. Everything that's bad that somebody ever did to us, and instead of all the good, and instead of letting the good cancel out the bad, we let the bad cancel out the good. And then what happens when we get when we're upset with somebody? We start to assassinate their character because we don't like what they did to us. And then we go assassinate their character and talk about bad about them to other people when we never really explain the whole picture, and it's really really bad. God hates that. As a matter of fact. When we get together on Sunday, we're going to talk about the things that God hates. Because He loves us so much, but He hates sin and the sin that contaminates our lives. And we know that God's in the restoration business. And the only way He's going to restore us is through discipline. It's just the way it goes. Okay, so once we can face and accept that we have been insane in these ways, we are closer to recognizing how desperately we need God's touch. To restore us. Coming to believe in step two is a process of becoming aware of a greater reality than anything we can see with our eyes. God is willing at any moment to help us overcome our addictive behavior or our sin nature and unmanageable emotions. By engaging in this process, we allow God to restore us to right thinking and to clear and to clear faith in his power. Then we can be free from the isolation and grandiosity and the tortured thoughts and feelings that accompany our sin nature. How many of us let our emotions control us at times? Right? The devil. See, people think that they're emotions, but in all reality, they're spirits. You see? See, emo they're not emotions, they're spirits. The spirit of what? Bitterness. The spirit of resentment. The spirit of fear. These are not emotions, they're spirits. And, what, and, and the devil puts these spirits into our thinking process. And it what? Causes us to get bitter 
afraid to serve God, to do all these things. And we know that the fruits of the Spirit are what? Love, joy, peace. Those aren't emotions either, right? It says the fruit, it doesn't say the fruit of the emotion. It says the fruit of the Spirit. Joy, peace, patience. See, we're not born with patience. That's the fruit of the Spirit. How many of us are impatient? No. No, I could never imagine. I could never imagine any of us being impatient. Here's the thing. We, we also want instant recovery. See, and this is, see, nothing good is instant, okay? Just like if you try to make a cup of instant coffee instead of getting one that's brewed fresh and done in the process that takes what? However long it takes to brew a, a nice cup of coffee, right? The instant coffee does not taste half as good as, you remember that sand or whatever they used to be? Yeah, right, you just add hot water to it and uh, it would melt and it was like instant. But we want instant recovery and instant recovery doesn't last either. It's, it's only surface. See, God wants to change us from the inside out. So first he has to get in and plow up the hardness of our hearts. He needs to get in there. He needs, we need to understand we need to get rid of the bitterness and the anger and the rage and keeping score with people and, not, and being able to forgive and forget and to love one another unconditionally like this church is all about. When somebody walks through the door of this church, no matter where they've been, it does not matter. We don't ask them where they've been. We just welcome them home. We already know where they've been. People that haven't come to church, we already know that the devil's got them in the grip and it's not even their fault because it, they're under, there's two forces out there, good and evil. And one of them's going to control you. And whatever one you feed is going to win. It's just the bottom line. And that's why when we come to a recovery group, we understand that we're feeding our spirit and strengthening our spirit so when the devil comes a-calling, we can what? Say no to him and just shut the door on him. Instead of shutting the door on God and opening the door to the devil. Can I get any men here? But you can't have both. You're going to love one and hate the other. See, God gives us a new desire to hate our sin nature and to love our new nature. See, if you still love your sin nature, you're going to what? Keep sinning. But if you love your new nature, you're going to fight it. And now you're going to fight it with what? You come to recovery group. You go to Bible study. We what? We have the fruit of the Spirit. We have God. We have all these tools to help, help us to stay in the Spirit to overcome our what? Flesh. You remember the TV show, The Flintstones? There was a little angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other. And the devil was always pitchforking the angel off. And that's what the devil does in our sin nature, pitchforks the angel off. But when we have our new nature and we strengthen it, we pitchfork the devil off. And now we have the angels surrounding us. And now we're what? We're, we're, we're under God's grace and his peace and that freedom to what? Do the right thing. But that's a process. All right, go to Hebrews. Everybody here? Look at from verse 1. God's discipline proves his love. We have to get the right state of mind here to understand how God's going to do this now. How he's going to restore us and what he has to do to do it, you have to understand the process. If you don't, you're going to walk away from all this because it's going to get painful. Crucifixion is painful, especially the flesh. Jesus is the ultimate example of crucifixion, the pain and the suffering. Therefore, verse 1, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. So everybody has particular sins in their life. They're like, all right, say you get up in the morning, and, and it's saying the weight that slows us down. So say you put a 25-pound plate and you hold it in your hand, and you take that with you all day. Eventually, it's going to slow you down so you can't keep going. So that's what it does. That's what your sin does. It slows you down from your journey with the Lord. Your sin nature slows us down, and it trips us up. Now, let's keep going here. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. How do we do this? 
by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Now, now, when we say keeping our eyes on Jesus, do I mean I'm going to get a poster and put it on the wall and we're just going to stare at Jesus all day? Oh, you're not supposed to do that? You can, but I ain't going to do nothing for you. It's talking about we keep our eyes on the Word of God. Okay, that initiates and perfects our faith. Okay, it's the word of God that renews us and changes us. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, then you won't become weary and give up. So here's what happens. When you start to get overwhelmed and people start attacking you, you start to what? Think of all the hostility that Jesus endured. And then you won't become weary and give up. Because a lot of us get weary and give up and we let our sin nature take over. After all, look at verse 4. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child or he corrects or chastens. I don't like that word punishes, but he chastens us or he corrects us. Each one of us he accepts as his child. So in other words, like, if God doesn't discipline you, that means you don't belong to him. So that means it has to be. And we have to get disciplined. Now, let's, let's keep going here. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who was never disciplined by his father? Now, you see the way kids are out in the world today that don't get disciplined by their father. It's crazy. They just run around rampant. They have no respect for anybody. And parents are not disciplining their kids anymore. Because they say that it's abuse now. To discipline your kids in the world today, you're abusing them. They're saying you're abusing your kids to discipline. Listen, the Bible says you've got to beat the sin out of them. That's how sinful they are. You're abusing them when you don't. Exactly. But the world, oh, don't touch your children. Don't touch, don't. Listen, <laughs> my father used a belt on me and I, need, and I needed it. Because if it wasn't for that pain, I wouldn't be what? So disrespectful to my mother and everything else? After that, after you get some pain, you get respect. Now, now look at verse 8. If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and not really his children at all. So in other words, like, we have to understand when people, we get disciplined, we get mad. God, why are you doing this to me? I'm correcting you. Look, there's something wrong with you. I'm, I'm correcting you because you're a sinner. There's something wrong with you. What it is, it's the wrong perspective. People don't understand how God works. Since, look at verse 9. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us. How about an amen here? Amen. So that we might share in his holiness. You see, his discipline makes us holy. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. Yeah, we get it. it it's not. It's painful. But look, what it, look at the result from it. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So when he disciplines us, when we get the pain of suffering for that, what? We get back in line and we start living right for God. When we don't get disciplined is when we what? Walk away from God and start living our self-centered life again. Look at verse 12. 
So parents who don't discipline their kids are doing them injustice. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path to your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. Now look at verse 14. Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that no one of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Make sure no one is immoral or godless like Esau, who traded his birthright as the firstborn for a single meal. You know that afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he begged with bitter tears. You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command. Even If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I am terrified and trembling. Well, I'm going to stop there because if you don't have a healthy fear of God, okay, you're going to continue sinning whatever way you want and expect nothing to come from it. I don't know about you, but I have a healthy respect for God. I fear what God can do to me if I get off the path. How about you? Fear is a good motivator. Now, fear in the Bible is respect. You have reverence for God and you respect him because you want to what? Do the right thing so he doesn't have to correct us. God just wants to lead us by the eye, not the rod. See, the, the eye of God's word. You know when you did something wrong? Your parents would give you that. The eye, right? To stop. Before what? The rod, right? They give you the eye and say, hmm, better stop now or... Punishment's coming. It's the same thing with God. He leads us with the eye of the word saying, look, the Bible tells us that it's not right. Stop. So I don't have to what? Use the rod to correct you. Let the eye of the word correct you. Can I get any men here? So we don't have to get beat up by the Lord. He'll do it. He'll do whatever it takes to correct us. All right, now go back to Hebrews 11. Back up. Now we're going to talk about hope and faith. Page 1589. Step two. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Step two is often referred to as the hope step. I'm coming to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. We will remember what it was like to live sanely and have the faith to hope that sanity can return. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Hebrews 11.1 1. How can we be confident that something we want is going to happen, especially if all our hopes have been dashed? How can we risk believing that the life we hope for is waiting for us around the bend. The Bible tells us that the key is in the nature of the higher power we look to. We are told that anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and he rewards those who sincerely seek him, wholeheartedly. Hebrews 11:6. If we see God as one who is reaching out to help us, we will be more eager to look for him. If our faith is not mature to that point yet, we can ask for help. One man came to Jesus asking him to help his young son who was afflicted by a demon. He said to Jesus, Have mercy on us and help us if you can. 
What do you mean if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Now, are you humble enough to admit that there's times in your life when you are in unbelief? There has to be. <clears throat> so, what is a good prayer? Lord, help me to overcome my unbelief. God wants to bless us and set us free from everything, right? What stops us? Unbelief. We just don't believe it. Because a lot of us are seeing is believing. See? But our faith, we just we got to believe it by faith. You, we can't see it. The result is by faith. When we trust Him, it actually happens. You walk by faith, walk by faith not by sight. You see? We have to get over the hump of our emotions into the facts of the word of God saying, look, I already got the victory. I don't know why I keep doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this out of habit more than anything else because I already been set free of it. Mm -hmm. Right? We do it out of habit. We're creatures of habit. How many of us sitting in the same chair that they were last week? <laughs> of course. Of course. Cookies not. Comfort zone. <laughs> but we're creatures of habit. So even after we overcome something, out of habit, we might still keep doing it, even though it's all done. God already freed us from it. <laughs> and so, you know, we want, to, we want to develop good habits, not bad ones. So we have to get rid of the bad ones and what, get new ones. Like I have a habit of coming to church on Saturday morning. To open the doors so we can do some work here. It's a habit. Mm -hmm. If I don't do it, I will, I'll feel like there's something wrong. Yeah, you see? Those are good habits to get into. Like whenever the church is open, to be here. That's a good habit. It's easy to do a bad habit, right? Bad habits are easy to take care of. The good ones are the ones that we struggle with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, now listen. Have mercy. Help me overcome my unbelief, right? We can start by asking God to help us to have more faith. Then we can ask him for the courage to hope for a better future. All right, now let's go read. Let's read that scripture. Let's go to Hebrews 11. Great examples of faith. What is faith? Well, it's going to tell us what it is. <laughs> faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us a assurance about things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. And what we see now... What, no, what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. See, we believe that, right? By faith, we believe that. We weren't here when it happened, but we believe it happened. By faith. It was by faith that Abel brought a more accepting offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man. And God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead... He still speaks to us by his example of faith. So what is, it, what, is the, what is the example? He gave him the best of himself. See, that's the example. You want to get blessed by God? you got to give him the best of you, not the last of you or the leftovers. That's why, that's why Cain killed David. He was jealous of him. He wanted to, but Cain was what? Selfish. He gave God the, the, word, the, last, the, the last of him, not the best of him. God wants the best of you. We want to give him the leftovers. It doesn't work that way. The examples are in the Bible for a reason. <laughs> okay. Verse 5. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. So imagine the rapture took place back then. Mm 
Right? He got raptured. He got taken up. That's what's going to happen to us. If we're in the, if we're in the times of his return. We're out of here. Still alive. That's weird. It's going to be crazy. We're going to be transformed in the blink of an eye. Imagine. You're going to blink your eye and then you're going to be like a new creation. Totally renewed. If you're in that, in that part of the transformation. Wow. Either way, it's going to be, it's going to be like when, when, we, when we die, we're going to fall asleep like we fall asleep and then you're going to wake up and it might be a thousand years later. That's all my work. But you're going to wake up. You go to sleep and then you wake up. You, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be awesome. Either way, it's a win-win for a Christian. Yes. Yes. But uh, people get the idea that, you know, people are watching over us now and they're floating around. <laughs> you, know, no. you know, my mother can't see me in the bathtub. My mother can't see me in the bathtub right now. You know what I mean? It's not... Lack of knowledge. It's lack of understanding, yeah, right. Okay. Well, then they don't know the Word of God. That's what it is. <laughs> if that was the truth, it'd be like, what the heck, man? Where am I going to I can't even, like, be anywhere by myself. Everybody's always around me. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, right? Okay. <laughs> now look what it says. <laughs> and keep you on the right track, you know? Saying, you know, your mother's watching you right now. Okay, Mom. <laughs> okay, <Chris. laughs> All right, verse 6. <clears throat> now, it is impossible to please God without faith. Now, this is so, people try to please God by going to church, by doing their religious duty. They think that that pleases God. What pleases God is our faith in Him and our trust in Him and our faith in Jesus Christ. The things that we do after that is the fruit of our salvation. We go to church because we want to go to church. We help others because we want to help. And that's the fruit of our new nature. It's not something that, that it doesn't please God. Our faith is what pleases God. Our faith and our trust in Him is what transforms us. Can I get an amen here? You can't, you can't get an inward fix from an outside solution. He fixes us from the inside out. Religious duties are the fruit of our salvation. Okay. Now look what it says in verse 7. Oh, no, it is impossible. Please, uh, anyone who wants to come to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. Now, does everybody know where the boat was built, right? Mm -hmm. Where? In the, desert. In the middle of the desert. It didn't even rain yet. Yeah. Didn't even know what, water, what it was like. A hundred years went by before that came. People were mocking him and judging him. And I'm sure his faith got tested at times too. Thinking, Lord, what are we doing here? Listen, God's timetable and our timetable is so different. Everybody thinks that God's going to act when we want him to act. Look, it might take the rest of your life for him to do what he wants to do, what he's got to do in you. You have to accept that. There's no such thing as instant, instant maturity here or instant deliverance. You wish it was that easy. Poof, it's done. There's a lot of hucksters that'll tell you that too. Yeah, they call them deliverance, uh, whatever they call them, deliverance pastor, whatever they call them. But there's only one that can deliver you. Jesus. <laughs> no, let's keep going here. It was by faith. No, it was, no, it was by faith. No, God who warned him about the things that had never happened before. It was by faith Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home 
and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. <clears throat> a city designed and built by God, not people. <laughs> it was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child. Though she was barren and was too old, she believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. A nation with so many people, like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there was no way to count them. No, no. God still kept the promise with Abraham, didn't he? Even though he went sidetracked and tried to fulfill it himself. How many times do we try to fulfill something ourselves, but God still promises he's never going to leave us, nor forsake us, and he's going to do what he said he's going to do. The only thing that sets us back is us. Abraham still received the promise, but it set him back 15 years by getting involved with God working. Most of the time, we get in the way of God doing what he has to do. These are all examples that we should follow, saying, you know what? I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to pray. I'm going to have faith. I'm going to keep doing the right thing while I'm waiting. And then I'm going to watch it happen. And I'm going to stay out of the way. <laughs> now look what it says in verse 13. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed, not ashamed to, call their, to be called their God, for he, was prepared, for he has prepared a city for them. Now listen. We're not going to get it all down here. You have to understand that. Everything that we hope for is not going to happen here. Everything we hope for is going to happen up there. So what do we do while we're waiting? We do the same thing. We do the right thing. We try to bring others into the kingdom. We live right. We understand that the guarantee, the promise is... That he's going to give us a new heaven and a new earth someday. And we're going to be living with an out of sin nature. Oh. Wouldn't that be great if that just happened like right now? Yes. Well, the way things are looking, I mean, I'm not a prophet. I don't understand, you know, I don't know, but it's certainly getting closer. It's certainly getting closer. I mean, you know, only God knows the times. The thing that the whole thing of it is for us to be ready and not to be caught unaware. To be ready for when his return comes. So, well done, my good and faithful servant. Don't say, Lord, go back. Don't come back yet. I'm not done. I'm not done living my life yet. Can I get an amen here? Because he's restoring us. Let's read the faith thing on that. See it over here? Hebrews 12, 1 to 4. Our addiction or our sin nature interferes with our ability to win the race of life. Many of us feel like a loser who has just dropped out of the race. Faith in God can give us the motivation to run the race with a real chance at winning life's rewards. Hebrews 11 has been called the Hall of Faith. It mentions a long list of people whose lives were used by God because of their faith. The next chapter begins this way. Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Hebrews 12.1 
This illustration referred to the ancient Olympic Games. In Bible times, men wore flowing robes. Before an event, the athletes would strip off their robes and lay them aside to run without encumbrance. If someone tried to compete in his robe, he would get tangled up, losing both the race and the prize. So it is God's will for us to win the race of life. The robe of our reoccurring sin needs to be laid aside. There will be pain from the exertion, but we are told to pace ourselves and bear the pain with patience. And remember, others who have run the same race and finished well are cheering us on. Amen. So there's always hope. Never give up. Keep the faith. God loves you. He's never going to leave you. You're sealed until the day of redemption. Thank God you can't lose the salvation. We're going home to be with Him. That's locked in. Oh, thank God. Just imagine if it was based on our performance. None of us would make it. After we get saved, if, we had a, if it was based on our performance after we got saved... We'd all fail. Because we fail and we fail often all the way till we go home. So thank God it's just it's not dependent on that. It depends on our what? Our faith. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for letting me share that. We're gonna answer some questions now.